part of the expat, and I'm here with the other co-founder, Sharon Lorimer. Hey, Sharon. Hey, Tim. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good today. Well, we're here to talk about your latest cookbook, which is called Coupe de Monde. Yes. <laughs> and there's a copy somewhere around here. But <laughs> you can definitely find it on um, in iTunes. Mm. And if you're on the web, you can find it at doshibu.tv. There is a preview of the book there, so if you're watching from our homepage, then click on the link and you'll see a preview of the book, and then you'll know what we're talking about. And can you just give us a basic description of what Coupe de Monde is all about? It's really a journey with me through my cooking experiences. So as I became more global, I started to have more influences, more flavor profiles, more ideas for chicken. And I'm a big fan yes, of the and British I'm here. roast I'm chicken. Hold on one second, I think we're having some problems. It is launched, it's over here. We're launched. We have test cats. Is it off? I closed it. Right here, but I'll close it because I'll find it on um, in iTunes. Oh. And if you're on the web, you can find it on the TV. Yeah. There is a preview <laughs> there, so if you're watching from it's our it's home computer. page, then. So is that going to be recorded all the way through? Or I don't really know. Are we going to have to stop the recording and start again? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I don't really know what so to do. So as I. How is it I started to oh, I know. have more influence on flavor profiles, more ideas for chicken. And I'm a big fan oh, yes, of uh, Ah, success. Okay. okay. Great. Might cut that out later. <laughs> <laughs> so if this is your first broadcast, like it's our first broadcast, then don't have a web page open to your home page with the link on it because it starts playing in delay. And then you start hearing yourself <laughs> coming to the computer, which is What's odd. happening? <laughs> So okay. back to chicken. We're talking about chickens. Yes, yeah. and uh, what what basically coupe de monde is all about. Right. So it's really about my life experiences as a cook. So coming abroad, I really love um, a roast chicken dinner because I grew up in the UK and Scotland, and I wanted to make it more exciting. You know, I'd be going to all these fantastic restaurants and all these great places, and it was just really good fun. But the roast chicken could be a bit straightforward sometimes and I wanted it to be spicy so I started using all the different influences from all the different cuisines that I was experiencing and started creating different stuffings, different ways to cover the bird, different vegetables, all kinds of things that were influenced by different uh, cuisines from around the world. And for those who aren't familiar with the kind of British Sunday roast tradition can you just kind of uh, expand a bit on that, on on what the significance <laughs> is, what, what your typical <laughs> Sunday roast would be? Yeah, sure. I mean, a Sunday roast is just one of those things that is culturally specific, I think, to the Brits. What we like to do is that we like to get up and have basically just lunch on Sunday. So we have this enormous meal. It's kind of like maybe a Christmas dinner you'd be used to or a holiday dinner. That It's huge, but we do it every Sunday. And a lot of us like to go to the pub for that too, so that's kind of something that pubs have kind of done for a while, is that you get up and it would be a lazy Sunday or maybe you have some events and then go and have you know a traditional Sunday lunch in the pub with your friends or family and then head out you know afterwards, head home, watch some TV to prepare for the week ahead. So it's a very, very warm, cozy, homey kind of experience for me. And for those wondering why you have something called dinner at lunchtime, it's actually going back. I had to look this up, but um, you go back to the original origin of the the word dinner, um, and it's meant the largest meal of the day. <laughs> and so it used to be that at midday was the largest meal of the day, and you'd have a dinner at midday. And then the French, to be more fashionable, kept pushing it later and later and later till seven or eight o'clock. Are you evening. sure that's about fashion? Yes, it was. It was. <laughs> Is it not just a rivalry thing? Uh, between the English, just to annoy <laughs> the English. Just to annoy the English, the yeah. roast beef. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think that could be it. Too. There's a little bit of rivalry as well. There's somewhere in Wikipedia where some um, Englishman had gone to Paris and was dismayed that they didn't get dinner until 7 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> he was starving all day. <laughs> oh, that's a sad story. 
It's a tough place to stuff in Paris. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's terrible. Well, they make great roast chicken there as well. Yeah, so they do. a good yeah. place to go for a, a great roast chicken. We had a nice uh, roast chicken in a French bistro on Thursday night, actually. Yeah. Le Bochin Bois on the Upper West Side. Really good roast chicken. Very nice yeah. restaurant. Yes, a nice bottle of Sancerre to go with their roast chicken. That was very enjoyable. Yeah. So getting back to Coupe de Monde, so you mentioned that you wanted to kind of, you know, have the Sunday Sunday roast chicken, but that wasn't straightforward. Mm. So, um, you know, so you're playing around with different stuffings and different bastings and things like that and different spices. What, what was your first experimental chicken? The very first one, yeah, I got made fun of a lot for this because uh, in most of the dishes that we cook in the UK, wine is not featured very prominently, but I used to use wine to keep the meat dry, and I also like the taste of it. It smells great when you're keep cooking. Keep the meat dry or juicy? Yeah, oh, sorry, keep it juicy, yeah, yeah of okay. course. Well, if the meat was going a bit dry. Yeah, probably, right then. Yeah. You know, you pour on a little bit of wine, and then you've got quite a lot of juice of the bird, and then you're basting. That way you can get a really juicy bird, and wine smells great if you're cooking as well with wine. One of the good things about these roast chickens is that the smell, all the aromas are really great when you're cooking it, not just of the chicken itself, but all the different spices and wines that you've got going in there too. So, and If you're a teetotaler, then mm. I guess you could use white wine vinegar, but if you're probably a teetotaler, it's probably not the book for you. <laughs> well, you could just take out the wine. It wouldn't yeah. actually matter at all if you did it without wine. Then it would be easy. But that's what I've noticed about uh, Sharon's chicken uh, recipes. Um, she's always big on on using a lot of stuff to keep um, the uh, chicken, you know, very moist and tender. So by the end of it, though, at the end you have this like really nice kind of natural gravy that has all the juices from the chicken, some olive oil maybe, and stuff like mm. that, and lots of white wines mm. can cooked in. <laughs> And that really makes it, and lemons too. Mm -hmm. If you put a lemon in there, that could be really nice. Mm. And um, that makes a really nice natural gravy for the um, for the chicken, which is always good and goes well with the stuffing and things. So you made your first one the last weekend. Um, what did you think? Did you enjoy making it? What did you think of the process? I like the process. I think it's it's straightforward. It's fun to um, be able to experiment. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's like yeah, you can look in the cupboard, see the spices, think what might go together. You know, I was thinking, you know, last time we have this uh, lavender honey, mm. and I thought that actually might be nice if you mm. kind of in a honey glazed chicken with a lavender and stuff like that. If we actually had lavender, you could put some in there. Yes. And kind of just, right. just for the aromatics, yeah, inside the bird. And, yeah. Instead yeah. of stuffing, you could use lavender. Right. That would smell nice. Yeah, lavender honey and some on the fruit top. and things like that, yeah. and some apples or something mm, like that. Peaches, like, maybe. That would be really good, roast peach. Mm, really good. Roast peach. Yeah, we'll have to note that one down and put it in the next book. <laughs> lavender and peach. <laughs> and so it's it's good, too, because um, you've got your stuffing, the potatoes, everything just goes in this one nice little kind of uh, pot we have that we put our chickens in, a serving dish that's uh, like Colombian, you know, um, cookware. It's really nice. And so mm. everything goes in there, and so it's all pretty straightforward. And then, you know, then once you've done the prep work, you're done. Then you just kind of just watch chicken, um, you know, test it now and then, mm. take, take the temperature, or you know, see if it's basting well, and then stab the potatoes. And it's it's pretty it's easy to make a really kind of signature recipe, which is right. Kind of, mm. Because the book goes takes you through step by step how you would actually create your own chicken. So I think Kim. Kim's obviously read the book a couple of times there and did some editing for me. And there's very nice front cover pictures yeah, of I'm me gonna... looking really silly in a chicken hat. All the and... photos are <laughs> taken by Shad except the one she's in. Yeah, <laughs> that would be quite... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could have a timer. <laughs> That's again. true, I could run around with a timer and maybe I'll try that next time. But uh, I, think I don't, you I don't did leave a good my job. camera unattended in Riverside Park. <laughs> <Some> no, <right? laughs> Some jogging by. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, so it did help you to be creative then, because there, yeah. there's part of the book where it takes you step by step through how you'd actually figure out spices you liked or using your traditional spices. So if you're not British, then it's really easy for you to follow along and say, okay, it's not going to be you know something that I'm not familiar with or dislike. It's going to be something that I really enjoy and want to eat. So it's a really easy way to be creative, bring in your own cuisine if you already cook um, in your traditional style or, as Kim said, be 
uh, creative if you just off you know you've got tastes you like and ideas you want to try out then it makes it really easy to do that too I mean also it's good because um, you should it's it encourages like a, a lot of exper experimentation and I think that the thing about it is, especially if you're doing it the method that Sharon does in the book, um, the, the flavors you add that are added are pretty subtle. So that even if you make a mistake, you know, put it a thing that say, oh, I wouldn't use that the next time or something like that, right. it's not going to overwhelm the chicken. You're not going to be right. like, oh, dinner's ruined or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, sometimes like if we put something in, like the gravy can be a little bitter because it's reacted with something. Then we have learned mm -hmm. like not to add that, you know, mm -hmm. at, the, at the same time, but. You know, I mean, if you really want it to be um, really, you know, the, the flavor to really get into and fuse into the chicken, mm -hmm. then you could marinate it under the skin overnight, mm -hmm. and that pretty much. But the only one I think of that I think is really kind of strong flavored is this Jamaican rub, mm -hmm. spice rub we've done, mm -hmm. and that with the chilies and the scotch bonnet peppers and things like that. That's pretty. <laughs> that's a pretty robust <laughs> flavor. <laughs> I'm never sure what that word means. <laughs> Wrong, I thought. <laughs> I know, but it's not. It's not really much of a cooking term, is it? Robust. Is it? Is, I, I like, don't know. I was, isn't there a stereo? I disagree. <laughs> I've always grown up with it being a cooking term, like robust tomatoes. I think I there's a there's a, there's a robust. There's a tomato. Tasty, yeah. There's but a robust. tomato. Tomato sauce called robusto. <laughs> That's serious. I'm not making this up. I may be misremembering it, but I'm pretty sure there's a pasta sauce called Robusto. Robusto. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah, I'll like see Spanglish. Oh, robust right. ripe. Me. No, I'm serious. Robust <laughs> ripe tomatoes and stuff like that are being advertised to me all the time. I don't. Well, there you go. I don't think robusto. it belongs in economic terms. <laughs> you know, like George uh, Rosalind ran about a robust recovery. And our recovery's not I quite as know. robust. As I don't have to understand that word. I don't know what it means about what I'm going to taste. I don't know. I think of Gerard Butler in the 300 movie of the word robust. Maybe that's because he has a huge bust <laughs> in, <laughs> the, in the movie. <laughs> oh, well, moving on from Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> Back to chicken breasts. <laughs> uh, just taking a really <laughs> oh, strange, giggly turn. Okay, yeah. so let's. Um, Talk a little bit more about how you think about it. I mean, this is a great book for parents, and it's a great book for international families because it lets you open the door to other people's life experiences. And Kim and I were talking about something that I thought was pretty interesting. You were saying how, as a kid, you would have liked to have had this book to develop some cooking skills with. Yeah, and, and just kind of be able to, to bring back something from, I went did a lot of traveling when I was a kid, and the one, you know, you could always bring back souvenirs, and there was always tons of pictures and everything like mm -hmm. that, but, you know, one thing you couldn't really take back is the smells and the tastes mm -hmm. and things, and I think that would have been good, and so, you know, to take a simple, straightforward dish, my mom made roast chicken once a week, usually, so we could have, like, you know, done a Singapore roast chicken or something like that, mm -hmm. and just had taken some of the spices from Singapore. And mm. used it, and um, and use that for the to rub with the chicken, or, or create a Singapore stuffing or something like that. Mm. I actually, have a noodle stuffing would be kind of interesting. I know. Well, we saw rice, stuffed rice in the chicken. That's yeah. not in the book, but that sounds like a really great thing. Uh, I saw someone make a really nice rice stuffing, and then they put the whole chicken and immersed it in um, chicken stock, and they cooked it that way. And uh, that looked really nice. It's an individual one. I think that was Morimoto, right? Yeah, I think that, he's, he's, yeah that's, that's his recipe. recipe. But, yeah. That looks really, really good. This is kind of a little bit more traditional in this style that it's presented, but you can see how other cuisines also have ways of cooking and traditions. Boiling a chicken in a pot was also um, a very traditional style, like pot au feu. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a nice restaurant in London, if you were in London, that you can go to there. Mm -hmm. Called that, right? The pulling pot. Yeah. Oh, the pulling pot. That's not the pot of the. Does that mean that? Oh, very true. Yeah. I know, right? I think it does, yeah. <laughs> Good, so at least didn't get that one wrong. And, uh, <laughs> we'll look it up afterwards and yeah, figure well, out if it's totally different. Well, let me know. <laughs> Use the educated yeah. chicken. I know, right? <laughs> I'll feel bad if I eat the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to think about that when you're doing these recipes about yeah, no. what the chicken might have become. The opportunities for going by the chicken so you can have lunch. So why chicken? Do you think it's the most versatile or do you think it's in the, in the most need of kind of like some sort of... Yeah, I think when I was growing up, um, 
I don't like plain food. So I was very interested in different spices and different tastes. And I think it's just come out of that. You know, I love to experiment. We grew up and started eating Italian food was the first big foray out of what is our traditional cuisine. My grandmother used to cook very sort of French styles. So, you know, it'd be sauces. And she would like very simple sauces, and I would like very spicy things. So it kind of, for me, it was just a natural sort of leap for my tastes. You know, I, I enjoy spices, so there's no reason for me not to put a spice. It looks like any other dish to me, just, oh, it'll be fine with uh, this on it. And, you know, after a while, you start, start experimenting with things that you wouldn't normally put on the top. And that I think that that's one of the things to think about that makes this really, really easy for you is that you can make up your own recipe, but you could also just buy any kind of dry or wet rub. So if you've got a pot in the uh, fridge that's got already mixed together, and all you need to do is spread it across the chicken and leave it there. And it's really, really easy to make it. It doesn't need to be to sit there. So a lot of people marinate to get spices into their foods, but this doesn't need to be marinated at all. And they'll still have the really great taste and the really great aroma. So you, know, you didn't have to worry about that. So it made it really easy. And I think, you know, I love Indian cuisine, but it's really hard to make it home, mm -hmm. I find. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about all the different flavors and the profiles so we started to buy you know marinades pre-made marinades and then just use them in a rub because there's no reason that uh, you know, a traditional tandoori marinade can't be used on a whole roast chicken as opposed to a tiny little cube of chicken but I think just making that first leap into how do I use these how can they be used is it all right to do that and you don't want to waste you know your whole lunch so it can be a little bit daunting to think for the first time, you know, if I'm going to go into this sort of creative field and try to cook for myself, experiment a little bit, then how do I make it kind of less risky? And definitely those pre-made marinades make it really, really easy for you to just spice it up. Yeah, and to start getting a sense of what kind of flavors hmm. you like and stuff like that. Like, you know, the, I mean, those are pretty, yeah, pretty ubiquitous now. So you could get, yeah. like, you know... Uh, coconut milk Thai one or something like that, mm -hmm. or you could do like you know, um, yeah. There's there's caramel ones and just even you know spicier ones. And, right. And you can always spice those up too. If you get the the pre-made ones, just buy a chili, right. And add some stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and add a little garlic or a little mm -hmm. fresh ginger if you wanted to do that. Definitely, ginger is a really uh, great smell and spice. It goes really well with chicken. Yeah. Something you can do that's something that I done. Um, if you have a recipe, great recipe that you love, and there's a great rub in there, and it's maybe been for pork, then a lot of these will go really well with your chicken too. So you can transfer them. You don't have to start from scratch. You can just use um, something that's already established for you that you understand how it's going to turn out, what the taste is going to be like. Because I think that's important. So it's not to have you know, a disaster on your first couple of tries out okay. and you don't want to have a really experimental dish that everyone in your family is thinking, oh, I don't want to eat that. Well, for the first one, if you're going to do your first one, I recommend um, doing just a couple of the tips that are in the book. One is um, is putting slivered garlic into the chicken itself mm. that kind of it melts and infuses in the chicken when it cooks. Mm. And then just pick one spice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, you know, don't go for the, even, don't worry about doing your own stuffing. Mm -hmm. Maybe put it, you know, you can, again, we talked about, like, putting apples and things like that into mm -hmm. stuffed into the chicken. That works very well. Mm -hmm. It smells very nice. You know, so you can put some fruit in there or some lemons and one spice that you like, mm -hmm. that you know you like. And then it could be, like, an odd, you know, like a, a you know, um, you could buy, you know, maybe, like, you know, like Emerald's Essence or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like a, a, a right. spice mix or something exactly. like that. And that would work. Mm -hmm. And then it's, like, then it's like, you know, you know you like that flavor. You're not, you know, doing anything too, um, you know, experimental, but you're giving it a different kick, and and I think, you know, it's surprising how much more enjoyable it is than just a straight up kind of right. roast chicken with stovetop and. Definitely, I um, the thing I like about the garlic is that it does infuse into the meat, and if you go onto the website at dishboo.tv, there's a clip there that shows you how to do that, so you'll be able to get some impressions of that. And this, work, this technique works also with meat and tofu. 
Yeah. So, you know, tofu. if you if chicken's tofu. not your thing, then try it with something else. And it really is tofu, nice. tofu, tofu really um, needs flavor in the United States. I would say so too, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think really it works. Nice it works on, you know, you've got to be bold with roast beef, you know. You're, you're going to have to use, like, some stronger flavors, mm -hmm. maybe more rub than you probably would. That's mm -hmm. one you might want to think about doing a couple of hours beforehand mm -hmm. to really infuse because, you know, that's going to want a lot of strong beef flavor. But... Right. I mean, yeah, I guess Definitely pork good. tenderloin would be pretty easy to do. Yeah. As a kind of thing. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, definitely. Lots of um, different ways to use this uh, techniques so you can start experimenting with flavors that you like in other foods as well. Once you've sort of, of course, once you've bought my book. Right, exactly. Definitely <laughs> buy the book. Definitely buy the book. It's buy the book and then start experimenting. <laughs> it does, and it's well worth it. Open up a whole new world of culinary <laughs> experimentation for you. But another thing to think about is using is stuff that just for the as aromatics. Mm -hmm. Like there's this French recipe that I know that calls for like eight cloves of garlic, mm -hmm. and you know chopped in half, and you just put it and stuff the chicken with it. Mm -hmm. And of course you're not supposed to eat the, the like eight whole heads of garlic. No. And stuff like that. It's not cloves. It's actually heads. So it's eight heads of garlic. Well, wow. and, and stuff like that. But just the yeah, those are you don't eat those, but it, the aroma is so strong that permeates the chicken and stuff like that. Uh -huh. so. Oh, that's cool. So you mean to put it inside? You could put it. You could put it inside, or you could put it in a separate dish next to. Mm -hmm. And that aroma will like cook, you know, with the chicken. So we're right. talking about using lavender. You would need mm. the lavender or stuff like that. Right. Rosemary is a lot like that. I think I find yeah. you put that on because it's the like rosemary is tough to actually eat, but mm -hmm. infuses a very strong flavor, mainly through the smell. Right. No, I think there are probably quite a lot of things like that that would give a great smell. Yeah. Um, and that that's one of the nicest things about cooking as well, that, you know, you want to smell it before it comes out of the oven. And People do that a lot with barbecue. It's gorgeous, with yeah. Smoking with wood chips and uh, things like that. Yes, exactly. To impart flavor. So you can right. choose that with your chicken as well. So stuff that, you know, you know, mm. if you have a backyard or something like that, you right. know, things that really smell nice in the backyard, you can bring mm. that in and use mm -hmm. that, even if it's not something that you're going to eat afterwards. Right, definitely. No, having a great smell around in the kitchen makes everybody happy. Especially if you have pets. Yes. <laughs> right. So they're, they're, for be, pets, yeah. not getting very much of the chicken, but they'll be alert. <laughs> <be out there. laughs> oh. <laughs> so tell me, what do you think about how this is built up? I mean, you've seen it happen over the years, and did you, is this what you expected um, it to turn out like the book or? Um, no, I mean I. I think that I expected the I expected the book to be a little more classic, you know, collection of recipes, mm -hmm. and I think it's much more like a like you know it's it's a, it's a kind of a story. I think there's a story in the book uh -huh. about how you've evolved to doing these different recipes. You mm -hmm. know how your lives lived different countries. It's been international. Mm -hmm. How you've had influences from people you knew before, or people mm -hmm. you know now, right? And you know places you've been. And so I think that now, yeah, it's, I think it's a lot more substantial than just a, a recipe collection. Uh -huh. And I think if you want to, you could make all the recipes in the book, you know, right. you know, once a chicken, once a week for, I don't know, like 10 mm. weeks or whatever. Well, it's really, I mean, it's, the book is split into a couple of different sections. So one section is understanding um, spices and how to combine them. One is understanding the process of putting together a dish that works together. Um, and then there, the section that Kim is talking about is a section where you're given a layout of recipes, and these flavors all work together. I've tested them all, and they're really nice, but they're sort of very different than the things you might normally put together. There's one with wasabi, sour orange, and coffee, which sounds like a bizarre <laughs> interaction, it's really but it's good, really, yeah, it was really good. It was really good, surprisingly good. I, that was the one that I was pretty skeptical about. Yeah, me too. I thought it might not. Coffee, it was a like coffee thing. Yeah, yeah, that that right. yeah. Hmm. Um, but I think that, and I'm always reluctant. I'm very meticulous when cooking. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, exactly measure the tablespoon and everything like that. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, I think in yeah you know, some things you have to do that, but other times you don't. And mm. So I, and I think this. The book kind of imparts what I learned from you, which is you know taking some risks, doing something that's uh, uh, different yeah. and stuff like that, and just you know, and doing a little improv. That's kind of like what I like to so mm. to come back and 
you know, we'd have, oh. have the chicken, and we were going to, you know, figure out what, you know, just look through the spice cabinet and see, you know, maybe mm -hmm. we bought something that day to use right. and then think, yeah. oh, we got curry leaves. What, what should we use with the curry leaves and mm -hmm. stuff like that? Mm. Right, I know. I mean, it is a great thing to do as a couple and a great way to bond. And we were talking earlier, it would be nice to do with kids as well, to let them choose something, a spice that they like, something they uh, enjoy the smell of, or a way for them to actually be part of a creative process that's part of a family event, as opposed to sort of having them excluded or you know, having them feel that you have to have specific meals that are set for children as opposed to them included in something that you also want to eat family style. And so this is a way of bringing in the, that idea as well, bringing in other people's um, attitudes and, and making them think, yeah, I'd like to cook, and this is what I want to cook, you know, this is what I like. So it's a, an inclusive idea. And, and now the crazy kid ideas <laughs> would be considered very, you know, Avant-garde cuisine, right, right, and like Hester Blumenthal kind of thing. Oh, it's like I want my chicken with chocolate and mushrooms. And <laughs> I bet you could yeah. do like a you know kind of dark mole with a mole, mole, mole yeah, with a picolote or something like that. Yeah, it's stuffing. You could do mushroom stuffing. Yeah, and mushrooms in the bottom of the dish. You could obviously make that work. So yeah. you know, with it, crazy ideas. If yeah, kids you have crazy ideas, you can just make them work, right? Right, and, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I like that idea. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really nice to sort of see. I think this cookbook has a very different structure because of its purpose. It's sort of designed for helping you become more creative, not designed for you to replicate a dish, but designed for you to actually understand how to develop a palate, how to develop a sort of family idea, and how for you to be creative as well, because that's something that I really enjoy um, doing in the kitchen. It's also one of those skills, you know, you, you kind of need. You can't always have, you know, five-star meals or exactly this. So it's nice to be able to go into the fridge and say, oh, I've got these four or five things. I'll just use them. Yeah. And here's my roast chicken, you know, got potatoes and chicken. And here's all the spices we've got sitting around. And so it's a really nice way to use everything that you have and sort of feel good about your interaction with, with eating and drinking and right. creativity. Definitely. So we've kind of come up on half an hour. Yeah, and uh, should we? As this is our very first broadcast, I think maybe we'll keep it to half an hour. For anyone who's interested in going abroad um, and is going to be working or moving abroad with their family, then we provide services for people who do that, and this is part of the things that we provide: helping people understand what the experience is like and how finding a way to express themselves and understand what they're going through. So, you know, get in touch if you need some help and definitely check out the book. Yeah, and it's really worth it. Yeah. It's a great book. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, nice to do this. We're going to be doing a lot more of them, so check out the homepage, doshibu.tv, for more information on when the events are coming up. But hopefully next time we won't have any technical problems. Yeah, we'll get better at it, I promise. <laughs> but also, if you have any ideas for things you'd like us to discuss or any topics, please email us. Um, you can, again, at doshibu.tv is the easiest way mm. to reach us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us if you're here with us live and if you're watching the recording. Then, you know, send us an email, let us know how you feel about it or, you know, leave a comment behind and we'll get back in touch. Thanks for watching. Thanks. Bye.